Welcome to another edition of the Mere Mortals Reviews. Today I'm reviewing the book Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. I'll focus in there. This book is written by Christopher Browning, who went to Germany after World War II, and he was looking through the files that um, a, a lot of interviewers and perpetrators of the of the Holocaust and World War II uh, were interviewed afterwards, and most of that was recorded, or a lot of it was recorded and kept in files. And so he went there to investigate. I'm not exactly sure what he was doing there, but uh, investigating, I guess, some of these files. And he came across the stories of Reserve Police Battalion 101. This was a battalion made up from uh, the men of Hamburg. And these were men who were not of fighting age. So they were roughly in their like 30s to 40s. Uh, I think it was a couple even creeping up into their 50s. And they were used as auxiliary, auxiliary police in uh, occupied Poland in, in particular. And it was all, almost like a way of keeping the order uh, in, in these places that uh, Germany took over. And so the it's basically the history of this battalion and what they part, partook in while they were there, uh, which in this case was a, a lot of the massacres or some of the massacres, as well as the transporting of the Jews from the ghettos onto the trains to be taken to the death camps. So it's um, not a pleasant reading, but uh, extremely interesting at the same time as well. So uh, essentially after Germany went through Poland and they were fighting off in the uh, other areas, this police battalion came in and it was roughly around 500 men, uh, you know, rising from the rank of, of major down to the, the lowly privates, uh, made up of three pl- three. Pl- platoons and then I think three companies in each platoon and uh, essentially one day they were given the order of from the very top so like Hitler, Himmler that sort of level you're going to have to uh, massacre these Jews in this uh, town called Josephau something like that and the major there um, who, who commanded the this uh, battalion on the day of it happening, um, gathered all the men in, in like the town square after they'd herded the, the Jews together and basically told the men, look, you're gonna have to do something extremely difficult, extremely painful, um, murdering these Jews. And if you don't feel you're up to it, you can step forward now and uh, you'll be like given guard duty or, or something, you know, taken away from that area. Uh, and the reason the author I guess wrote about this battalion was because this was quite a rare instance of um, I suppose not as much Nazi inculcated men or brainwashed if you want to use that term um, because they were their middle age they'd grown grown up before I guess like the Nazi regime and so you know none of, the, none of these men were part of the Hitler youth apart from a couple of the the younger commanders and they knew about life before Nazi Germany. And so I'd heard about this book actually initially from uh, Jordan Peterson, who who played up the psychological aspect of of this, um, you know, decision that these men had to make. Um, Do I proceed with, you know, this this killing, this, uh, I guess, something that violated most of their ethical principles? Or um, do I step forward and, and, you know, risk the, I guess, ostracization of of themselves from their platoon from their um, fellow comrades and and things like that Uh, and i'd also heard of it from jocko willink as well and so uh, while reading through this book essentially the men uh, on this first massacre uh, have a lot of trouble with it they're intentionally some of them intentionally uh well for one they're not actually good at it so uh, a lot of the time they're not sure exactly where they're shooting so um, you know, they're killing men, women, children um, by shooting them. I get. I think it's they're trying to aim for the head or back of the neck, uh, but a lot of them miss or they get, um, you know, hit a, a different part. So the skull will explode and they get blood all over them and, and brain and stuff. Uh, and they they have a lot of psycholo- psychological troubles with this as well. So while they're, I guess, killing these these men and women, the the fact that they're doing it is dawning on them and it's it's taking a toll on on most of the men uh physically mentally and 
by the end of this one day where they were meant to kill uh, 1,500 Jewish people, uh, they they were barely man- managing to get through it. Uh, and so I think that uh, taking out like the cooks and, and people on guard duty, it was around, I think, six to ten um, Jews that each person had to kill, uh, although some would obviously do more than that and some would do less. Uh, and so they initially start off with this and they're basically all of them it seems to seem to have struggles um doing this uh, but after uh, i guess a bit more of, of being in poland seeing more of the jews and getting used to this sort of lifestyle um, they gradually become a bit more proficient at it a bit more willing um, and by the end there's even people who are you know wanting to go out and, and to kill jews and i suppose the the book has a lot of um aspects to it and it's it's a it's a minefield of of talking points you could talk about the i guess the free will how much free will did each man have um what was the social pressures on him to to do this versus not doing it brainwashing how much does that play a part of it how much does their justification um to themselves how they are able to live with themselves the, I guess the relative scale of, of good and bad and, and how their actions play into what their worldview would be, um, how many of them were, I suppose, religious and and using that or, or how does that play into their framework of their mentality of being able to do this? Um, you know, minimizing harm. Is it is it better to kill the the baby of the... Um, of uh, a Jewish woman who's who's going to get shot anyway, um, or or let it starve because you can't physically you know handle the burden of of killing the baby. Uh, the amount of anti-Semitism and and how much that played. So there's um, an insane amount of things to discuss, and um, you know it's a, it's a very difficult topic as well. It's not pleasant reading or hearing about this, but it is important to to remember and to realize what humans are capable of at the same time. So a couple of things really jumped out at me um, with this book. Uh, One of the things was how much of a, I guess, like a loner attitude or being a social misfit is required almost by default to be able to do the thing that you believe is, is just, is moral. And so when I say this is, if you imagine if yourself, you're one of these men and you know, you've, you've signed up to be in the war. Uh, and to be honest, you've actually signed up to be a reserve, but, uh, in this battalion, because you're just going to be a normal police officer. You're not going to be fighting on the front. So you probably by default almost have like a bunch of people who are not that interested in going to war and the, the glorified aspects of war, the, the bravery, the courage, the, unity among men, um, you know, being manly, that sort of stuff. And, uh, they're in this police battalion, but then they're called upon to do these, you know, pretty heinous acts. And one of the things that, that got to me was, uh, the author going through this seemed to think that probably about 10 to 20%, no more than that were, were people who either actively said, I'm not going to do the killing or would sort of shirk their duty by, um, intentionally missing or not being, or like when they were meant to be called up, disappearing, um, you know, sort of disobeying orders, I guess. Uh, and then the other end of the spectrum where there was, you know, probably another 10 to 20% of people who wanted to kill, who were interested in it, who, who liked doing that. Um, and those are probably what you'd call like the, the natural psychopaths or, or people who have this innate ability to do extreme, extreme harm without facing the, uh, I guess the, their own moral compass telling them like what you're doing is wrong. And then there's the people, you know, the bulk of the people in the middle who saw it as a duty, as something to be done. It was unpleasant. They didn't like it, but nevertheless, they were willing in one sense because they actually did it to, uh, to go through with this process. Uh, and so what it, what it actually seemed to me was you, you almost needed to have like a, a non-caring attitude of what people thought of you to be able to resist 
all the other pressures of of why you should be doing it you're following orders uh, which is you know that's part of any sort of hierarchy you you follow what comes down from the top and you you obey them the the social aspect of of being in a, a commanding unit in a you know a part of a brotherhood if you will the i guess indoctrination of the times you know in in germany if all you heard for the last 10 years leading up to world war one was you know the jews are responsible for their loss in world war uh, leading up to world war two the the jews are responsible for the loss of world war one the jews are responsible for the economic downturn um and then with hitler coming into power and i guess the re-emergence of of uh, germany as an economic power his way of thinking uh, produced results whether they were actually from him or that's just the the sign of the times uh all these factors would play a a big role in in inducing you to to do what you're being told to do and um even though you are offered the chance it's it's sort of like it's not something you'd expect i guess it'd be like imagine if you were at your normal job and then you're told by your boss you know what um you're gonna have to actually um you know do some something treasonous um i want you to send these files to the competitors or i want you to to move this hundred grand um to somewhere else blah 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 uh and it's that sort of like sudden impact where so a lot of people will say yes and a lot of people will and some people will say no um and you know that varying degree how much will it be uh, depends on all these factors so it's just incredibly complex uh, so so what i got from it is you almost needed to have something innate in you that would be willing to go against the grain because that is extremely hard to do uh, and as part of almost human survival it's almost like you're needed to to go with the grain and and if everyone's doing something you should probably do it as well uh, a prime example of this was i watched a recent documentary on the um, 2004 um, boxing day tsunami and earthquake earthquake and then tsunami and all the people who were running from the beach when they started to notice like oh there's a tsunami coming in if you were the one of the people who didn't do that you died so it's it's almost ingrained into humans this this ability to follow and do what others are doing the the justification of of men who didn't participate was funnily enough not particularly a, a moral like a, a good moral standing as we can compare it to now from our chairs and luxury homes and, and whatnot um, but a lot of the men who who refused to to participate in the shootings and and murders of of these um, you know innocent civilians was i'm too weak to do it i, I don't have the the fortitude uh, and so it was almost seen like even though they were were doing i guess the correct act which was not to murder people and i think you know pretty much everyone can agree that is a bad thing they were almost helping to justify it for the others because they were saying you know i was i'm personally too weak to do it uh, i know this is my duty i know and I, if i was stronger i wish i would do it but i'm not uh, and it was only the very, very few rare people who took the stand and said, no, I'm not doing this on, you know, the moral grounds that I think it's wrong to kill innocent people. And uh, so that, that's sort of justifying from the the people who were taking a, uh, a moral stance, but using, I guess, the wrong moral reasoning for it uh, in a weird way could have helped the other people who were actually doing the killings justify what they were doing because they're being told by others you know you're, you're strong for doing this you're um there's no there's none of that moral judgment from a person who's saying you know i'm better than you because i'm not doing it the the people who a lot of the people who were not participating not participating in the killings were saying i'm not doing it because i'm weaker than you so uh, it's, it's very strange that sort of thing where it's it, they're doing a moral good in one sense but in another sense they're they're doing a moral bad because they're they're helping others to justify their actions uh, so that's um extremely difficult as well 
The another thing that stood out was it didn't seem that a lot of people took active enjoyment in it. Uh, so I'm guessing this is sort of um, there might be like you know a subsection of of humanity where there are psychopaths, and then from that chunk, there's only a very small chunk in of that who are actually get enjoyment from it um and are you know actively seeking to go out and do that and those are the people you see nowadays who are the the serial killers and the mass murderers uh but there's also you know psychopathic people who can be induced with just a little bit of of help from you know an outside uh source and in this case it would be like the the nazi indoctrination the nazi way of thinking which can help them push push them over the edge justify it and then they're free scot free and clear they don't need um to listen to any voices in their head saying you know this is wrong you shouldn't be doing this so um there is that subject subsection of that but it seemed like most of the people there were having extreme difficulties and if you removed all outside i i think if you removed all of the outside um I guess pressures to conform to do this I think most would refuse if it was just a straight yes and no there's nothing else riding on the outcome uh, so it gets into that aspect of how humans can create our own systems and our own I guess ways of being that can induce us to do good and induce us to do the wrong thing as well incentivizing us in different ways which is you know ex- extremely complex and it's something we we definitely need to look out for in our own society um because this can creep up anywhere there's all sorts of uh all sorts of ways we can make incentives wrong and make people almost make people even if they would like to do the good thing it's better for them to do the bad thing so uh you can see this with the the hiwis which were the i it's like a short acronym for the volunteers from the countries so this would be like um polish people um native poland polish people i guess who volunteered to to help the the nazis and so what they would do is a lot of these people would become ex- executioners like professional executioners so the the reserve police battalion would herd up all the jews clear out the ghettos bring them into one central spot and then the hewies would be the ones doing the actual shooting a uh, point blank range into the um into the you know these just poor poor people uh, and a lot of them basically had to get drunk blind drunk to be able to come to do this task because if they tried doing it um sober it it very quickly dawned on them like or or like their body physically repulsed them from uh from being able to continue uh so i've i haven't really done justice to this book at all it's 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 quite a short read but it it does pack a lot and uh i suppose just some of the negatives that i found from this book was uh the author spent a whole chapter right at the end defending himself against uh like attacks of his books from his critics uh in particular from a guy called Daniel Goldhagen uh and to be honest this took away from the book um maybe in the time so this was like a a re-edition i guess and and added on this extra chapter uh maybe at the time it's it seemed like a good idea and um this was back you know before the internet so your re- reputation while very still very important nowadays rested a lot more in the mediums that people could see and so if someone was reading about this book they couldn't go on the internet and just type in his name and you know get a bit of information about him this was the way they were going to learn about the author and so uh, he he had to defend himself i guess or he felt he had to um but when you look at it now it seems just like you know there's so much bullshit out there nowadays why you spending time talking about your critics on here um granted if they have some some valid points it might be worth investigating uh, but it for me it just came across like way too defensive way unnecessary um but you know that's uh, up to him and and how he wants to defend his reputation 
Uh, with these sorts of books, I actually really like pictures being added. Uh, you can see on the front cover here, it's a picture. I think it's taken from the actual town itself of the first massacre, Josephel. Uh, and these are the points where, you, you know, it's just a snapshot in time, but it really captures just something, something crazy about it. You know, there's the Jews heard it in the middle, um, guys in their Nazi guys in their uniforms. And, you know, there's just this guy on the edge smiling, looking like he's having the time of his life. Um, and that also is what I find really interesting in these sorts of books as well, when it focuses on, on one detail or one story in this, you know, cause there was so much mayhem, so much bloodshed, it was very hard, hard for them to the author to, to pick on an individual point. Whereas, um, you know, I do actually like that sometimes, and maybe you could have balanced that a bit better with having, um, the, the overall storyline and then spent a chapter on one particular, you know, person who died and in, in that interaction. Uh, and the only other thing I would have liked to see was uh, a bit more of like a psychological analysis as well. The, the way I'd heard this book described by other people was that it really focused on that aspect of it, that, that aspect of the choice, the, um, I guess the, the choice for the men to, to step down if they wanted to or not, which is a very rare choice you'll get in a wartime context. And especially in this context of, of mass murder. So it would have been, I, I would have liked to seen that explored a bit more. Uh, I don't believe the author was an actual psychologist. So, um, I think it was more of a historian. So we went through as objectively as possible, um, with, the, the retelling of the story, the recounting of, of what happened with this battalion. And then at the end did like a little bit of a, of his own analysis, but still had that, that bit of distance, um, trying to remain objective. Uh, whereas me personally, I thought the book was, would tell the story of these people and then go real dive deep and, and explore that aspect of, you know, you, you've been given the choice to do good. Why did so few people take that option? So those, those are, I guess, some of my, my thoughts on the book, uh, definitely worth reading. Um, if not pleasant reading, um, it's a good reminder of, of what we're all capable of. And that was, I suppose, one of the, the main things that came out from the book was these are ordinary men. So the book's called ordinary men. And these were just regular everyday Germans from what you could tell. And they yet. 90% of them, 85% of them managed to, to commit the, you know, the ultimate act of, uh, of killing innocent people and on a just horrific, horrific scale. So it's, it's something that's in all of us. Um, I suppose one of the things that'd be interesting to know would be, you know, if, if there was a mixed group of, of men and women or, if there was older people in it as well, would you still get the same interaction that went on? Uh, obviously impossible to know. And, uh, you know, I really hope that in the future, nothing, nothing like this would happen again, but human history seems to repeat itself a lot. So there is a very good chance that things like this will happen again in the future. Uh, and I suppose it's just a wake up call for, for the individual to, to realize they are capable of, capable of this. Um, and you know, I include myself in that. I, I can easily see myself given the wrong incentives, given the wrong structure, the, the wrong upbringing, the wrong, I guess, situation, the easiest path would be the path that is the, the moral wrong. And so, you know, it's a, it's a call for me and a call for others to, I guess, try and prepare yourself so that if you ever are in this situation, you you'll be able to do what it takes to, to do the right thing. And, uh, so with that, I'm giving the book overall a, a seven out of 10, uh, I actually wished it was a bit longer. Um, it was, it was quite a quick read and yeah, I'll leave it at that.